right. Natalie and I are going to be kicking off the training today with an overview of utility planning for distribution systems. And other presenters are going to, will go into a lot more detail throughout the day. Specifically, I'll define distribution planning and the types of plans that utilities file. I'll describe our distribution planning framework and highlight typical state planning requirements and example state practices. And Natalie will cover objectives and priorities, which will feed well into the interactive exercise this morning. She'll also cover stakeholder engagement and equity and justice. So first, what is distribution planning? And what kinds of plans are regulated utilities required to file? So distribution planning assesses the physical and operational changes that are needed to meet the needs for safe and reliable service at its core. Now, typically, it's an annual process that the utility runs with a one to two year time frame. But there's also a longer term capital plan because some investments, like substations, they take a long time to plan, like at least six years, right? And to, to um, get the equipment and to build the facility. So that longer term capital plan is something that utilities have always done. And, and just, to, just to remind everyone, utilities have done distribution planning since they first began operating electricity systems or else they'd fall apart. The difference that what we're talking about today in large part is to make that transparent to all of you and to your stakeholders and have it more long term uh, and, and, and use in, in more advanced analyses to address grid modernization and distributed energy resources. So this is all about being able to see the long term plan. And so this, this utility plan that they've done, uh, the capital plan is a long term plan. It's typically over a five to 10 year period and it's updated every one to three years. All right, so we wanna make this a little interactive. And so we have a series of polls and Natalie will get them started and explain how they work. Scan the QR codes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a, a, a range of answers. Um, it looks like the uh, predominant ones were about 10 states or about 30 states. And the answer is, oops. <laughs> She's got it. Answer is about 20. All right, about 20 states in the country have established requirements for regulated utilities to file some kind of grid plan. Who got it right? Wow, we got one person. All right, so <laughs> we weren't trying to really trick you. Um, so this map is in a paper uh, by Berkeley Lab and NASIO on ways that state energy offices are engaging in distribution planning. And so you may think about it as you know the utilities and their regulators um, and, and stakeholders at large, but really state energy offices do a lot. Um, even if they're not directly participating in regulatory proceedings, they may be facilitating work groups or participating in them. Uh, they prepare a host of plans from comprehensive energy plans, to state energy security plans, climate change plans, all kinds of plans. So if you're a state energy office, do not feel left out in these two days, especially today where you might think about it more as a regulatory process. There's a lot of things that state energy offices already are doing. See our paper for more. Um, 
So this terminology about what is distribution planning varies by state, but distribution plans generally fall in four categories. All right, having trouble with the clicker, Jeff? Good. All right, the first type is what we call a system improvement plan that enables expedited cost recovery for some ty types of specified investments, and this is typically a legislative uh, requirement. So for example, in Indiana, utilities can file these system improvement plans for newer replacement transmission, distribution, and energy storage, and for a host of reasons, safety, reliability, modernization of the grid, and even for economic development. So this is really gonna vary by state. In Pennsylvania, utilities can submit long-term infrastructure plans to re repair, improve, or replace eligible distribution equipment. And these are just two examples. There are lots of states, actually, that, that have something like this. The second type of plan is a distributed energy resources plan. Uh, for example, in Nevada, regulated utilities submit a plan that evaluates the benefits and costs of distributed resources and considers ways to increase their cost-effective deployment and better integrate the distributed resources in the distribution planning process. The distributed resource plan includes DER forecasting and hosting capacity analysis to inform the utility's grid needs assessment for distribution planning overall. The plan is submitted every three years along with the utility's integrated resource plan. Several states require or allow utilities to voluntarily submit grid modernization plans by law, and I want to note that some utilities are filing these plans absent any law because they'd like to get a heads up of some kind of indication from the commission that some of these major grid modernization investments they might have a hope of getting cost recovery for. Uh, so these plans typically present a grid modernization strategy linking a proposed technology roadmap to stated objectives. And we'll be talking about stated objectives, but what I mean is state objectives. It's uh, really important that this whole planning process be objective-based. These plans typically enable expedited cost recovery for capital investments and programs. Of course, the commission can always say no. And so part of, um, I think, our job is to have the utilities do a better, jo better job of presenting their justification for these uh, programs. And then finally, an integrated distribution plan is using a systematic approach to satisfy customer service expectations and state objectives. The plan includes both the grid modernization strategy and a distributed energy resources planning program. The plan can evaluate and optimize solutions across domains, that is, in Hawaii, for example, they're looking across generation, transmission, and distribution and trying to come up with solutions that meet multiple objectives. Restructured states, they might have a coordinated planning structure uh, with uh, transmission and distribution, as is, is the case in Maine. So there's been a lot of activity uh, around the country in the last several years around distribution planning, both legislation and commissions having uh, some type of requirement or guidelines for the utilities, and why is that? Well, the magnitude of investment is, I think, the main reason. Distribution investments are growing over time and account for more and more of the utilities' capital expenditures. Last year, for example, just the investor-owned utilities alone, the uh, distribution investments accounted for 34% of CapEx, and that's more than $57 billion. So what are some of the potential benefits of going through a, an integrated distribution planning process that is public and transparent and engages stakeholders? Well, first and foremost for me, I'm a former regulator, also a former state energy office director, so equal, equal time with my hats. Increased oversight over these expenditures, I think is a pretty big deal. And equally important, improving the planning process provides a holistic and longer term picture of utility investment plans before they show up individually in rate cases. And as we all know, during the rate case, there, there may be bigger fish to fry. You know, I mean, 
it's very difficult in that process where there's a, a, talk, a clock ticking and a lot of other issues to really delve into this. So having these plans filed early, having commission review, stakeholder review in advance uh, is super helpful. There are other benefits as well. I think that these improved processes provide better opportunities for meaningful engagement by commissions and by stakeholders. And I think a better job of considering uncertainty, especially with electrification, there are a lot of unknowns about loads and where they're gonna incur and what kinds of investments may be needed. And also for distributed energy resources. These technologies can, the costs and the, the, the even the commercialization of new technologies can happen quite abruptly. And so having these scenarios is very important. And considering all solutions to meet the needs at least cost while you're considering risk. And finally, improved planning processes can enable utility customers and third parties to propose grid solutions and participate in providing grid services and bring their capital to bear. So not all of the solutions have to fall on utility rate pairs. All right, we are ready for our next poll. Okay, this is gonna take us out of because we already advanced. We have to go back, so just hang on. All right, but meantime, you can start thinking about the question. This is about you. What do you think are the biggest potential benefits from improving distribution planning processes? And by that I mean objectives-based, stakeholder engaged, longer term. Yeah, anybody have a question so far? Thank you. Good idea. Yes. This, the slides are already posted. So if you look at the email that says no before you go, that, that NARUC sent, uh, there's a link there, or you can just Google Berkeley Lab Integrated Distribution System Planning, and, and you'll find the slides. There are also the speaker bios, so you can learn more about these folks and agendas. Let's take more questions. There's also going to be a QR code. That I neglected to mention when I mentioned the QR code on the right, which is the evaluation. Uh, the QR code on the left is to that Berkeley Lab page. So if you yes. Yeah. So that gets uh, that's this may get the, hi Jamie. This may get to jurisdictional issues, right? To some extent, okay. So, not an attorney, um, have worked at a public utility commission and addressed these issues. So, my understanding is that it's all around the type of transaction. It's not about the size. Obviously, we're just talking about the distribution system. So, number one, has to be connected to the distribution system, right? And, you know, may be different, you know, different voltages in every service territory, right? But the ter in terms of what is state jurisdictional, it, it, it's the nature of the transaction. So uh, Corsup has upheld that net metering is state jurisdictional, as an example. PERPA facilities typically are, but not always. So the, the key issue is sale for resale. If, if it is the power is resold, that bumps it up to federal jurisdiction. If any attorneys who want to correct me on this, I'm happy to be corrected. But that, that's my understanding. It's clearly federal jurisdiction if it's sale for resale, so wholesale transaction. I don't know that I did the first time. Okay. Okay. No mousing. Okay. Okay. Um, you're going to tell me when to mouse then. So we're, we're starting over. We're going to go through the first question again. All right. I'll see if I can speed it up. And we're going to get to the second question. You get to type in your answers. Sorry for the technical difficulties. All right. We're going. Is everyone, are we good? I'm going to move forward. Okay. I can yell out the code if we need to. Yes. Yes, you can. Okay. We're good. 
We did practice at home. <laughs> you can all get the right answer this time. So we have uh, 20 seconds. I'm hoping we'll have the upper right. Upper, upper right. Oh, yeah, yeah, there we go. Look at that. Wow, good it. job. <laughs> good learning. OK, we made it. OK, Enough what do you out. think are the biggest <laughs> potential benefits from improving distribution planning processes. Thirty seconds. Okay, I see a lot of resilience and reliability, oversight, transparency, considering alternatives, completeness, flexibility, increased coordination, energy security, form of resilience, lower cost to rate payers, optimizing the grid. These are great answers. Um, fewer outages, uh, integrating more resources, more accurate forecasting, more equitable solutions and a more systematic approach to engaging all customers. This is great, thank you. We're saving these, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get the answers right next time. Uh, really? Yeah. Okay, everybody. All right, good, thank you. All right, next I'm gonna lay out our distribution planning framework. So th many of you may have seen this. This is from US Department of Energy, Modern Distribution Grid Series. You can Google it, a really helpful series of guides for states and, and utilities. So here, I'm gonna talk about the basic elements. We're gonna get into a lot more detail in this throughout the day. Uh, but the first step, again, is planning objectives. Again, I mean state objectives. It's good that utility has its objectives and they should state that in the plan and they should, you know, cue closely to that. But what are they doing to meet the multiple objectives of the state as codified in law and, and uh, public utility uh, commission guidance, executive orders, what have you. So that's the first step that's way on the left. And the second in orange is uh, up top is developing system-wide forecasts and scenarios. So this is utility system-wide because you wanna ensure consistency with bulk power system planning, which can include iteration with I ISOs and RTOs. For example, a lot of folks in the room, I'm sure folks from Illinois, for example, work with um, their um, you know, RTO to make sure that there's some sensibility between the, the utilities forecasts for DERs and loads and what the ISO and RTO are, are doing, right? That's super important. Um, utilities should consider multiple scenarios, like I said, for loads and distributed resources on the distribution system because they have the impacts on the need for and timing of bulk power system investments. Things like, for example, investments in transmission. So the yellow box are all the engineering analyses that the utility does for distribution planning. And that includes locationally granular forecasts. So they take the system-wide, utility system-wide forecast, and they uh, allocate them down to a distribution circuit and substation level. And they can also do that, by the way, with distributed energy resources. And California has enacted some um, uh, the State Energy Office in California actually is involved in that. And then resource and reliability analyses, we're gonna get into that in a lot more detail tomorrow. 
And ultimately, the utility comes up with its grid needs assessment. And that includes opportunities for all kinds of solutions, non-wired solutions included. So all of this informs this blue, the series of blue boxes uh, in the lower right. And these analyses inform the grid modernization strategy and the annual distribution plan. And ideally, these, these short-term plans are part of a long-term integrated distribution planning. And by long-term, I mean 10 years is pretty much the standard now. Up top in the upper right, in the gray box, are ways to source distributed resources for some types of grid needs. And we, we talk about pricing, programs, and procurements. And by pricing, we mean time-varying pricing of different kinds. It could be critical peak rebate. It could be critical peak pricing, real-time pricing, standard time of use pricing, and all of the variations, variable peak pricing, um, both for electric, electric vehicles and for homes and businesses. And programs, these are the things that we have uh, administered for a long time, everything from energy efficiency to uh, newer storage programs. And we also, um, for procurements, we're talking about solicitations for non-wires alternatives of different kinds. Stakeholder engagement is especially important in the beginning and in the end of the process when you're determining the planning objectives and when filed plans are reviewed. But there are a lot of other opportunities for stakeholder engagement, including forecasting assumptions, scenarios, and identifying grid solutions. So grid modernization, a real key reason why we're interested in these file distribution plans, it layers on top of and integrates with what we've, what we've done all along and that what we need to, to build on. So the foundational grid infrastructure. So starting at the bottom, of the pyramid, we're meeting safety and electric codes, that's must do. We're trying to achieve re reliable and resilient design. And we're replacing aging infrastructure like crazy now. And you know, this is the poles, wires, all that stuff, transformers. Especially having to size up for electrification, but, but just for the aging alone. So in the, in the middle of the, uh, the pyramid are the basic start for automation technologies. And then we're moving toward more advanced technologies for sensing, for protection, and for controls. And at the top are technologies and systems to improve integration and use of distributed resources, ultimately including microgrids. See Paul about this if you want to know more uh, from New Jersey. But microgrids are an interconnected set of loads and distributed resources that uh, are operated from the purpose of the grid as one unit. And when the, uh, when the system is unstable or where there's a power outage, it can disconnect from the system and island um, and then come back when the system is stable again. So they're super important for the future. So again, planning starts with principles, objectives, and, pro and the capabilities needed. And that's what defines the functionality that you need and the system requirements. And technology choices should flow from that. You don't pick the technologies first, which I think some, you know, we could say in this room, some utilities are want to do, right? It's a more systematic approach. So planning should support state goals. It should address these interdependent technologies. Remember, there's, you know, some foundational systems and technologies that you've got to install, like maybe an advanced distribution management system before you can layer on top of that some other components and projects. So these core components are really important. And you can also consider, and some states certainly are uh, underway with this, some types of proactive grid upgrades to facilitate customer choice, including for solar and for demand flexibility. All right, this figure is from Excel Energy's recently filed distribution plan in Minnesota. It shows how planned investments fit together over time. So this is a 10-year plan. And that gives you a more cohesive understanding of all of the investments that the utility intends to make over that time. So at the bottom are, the very bottom in yellow are the completed distribution projects in yellow. In green are the projects in process. And in blue are the planned projects over the near term, medium, and long term. Distribution planning is increasingly dependent on resilience planning again, our topic for tomorrow, as well as bulk power system planning, local planning, a lot of cities and counties 
have plans, sustainability plans, climate change plans, resilience plans, you name it. Uh, and there's a lot of interaction with other infrastructure, right? Water, wastewater, for example. <clears throat> what else do I want to say about the slide? On the, on the bulk power system side, Integrated resource plans should account for resources connected to the distribution system. So this is solar storage and grid interactive buildings. Basically, all this points toward better coordination across planning processes. And states are increasingly requiring utilities to coordinate across these processes. For example, New York's distributed system implementation plans, they support the state's climate legislation as well as its scoping plan, which is the framework to achieve greenhouse gas emissions, as well as increase renewables and provide equitable benefits. This chart on the right from National Grid in New York, I know it's hard to read, but remember you can download the slides and, and look at them on your laptop as well. Um, it shows, it's very similar to the Excel chart. It shows all of the investments over a period of time. I think this is roughly eight years. And starting at the top, it's laying out what it's, the utility plans to do for advanced metering. In purple, grid automation and management. And that includes DER management and advanced distribution management systems. In blue is more integrated holistic planning that includes EV charging capacity maps and energy storage and microgrid projects. In red are all the data ana analytics that come from having all this advanced technology and you know, knowing what to do with that data, including enhanced forecasting and hosting capacity analysis, the ability of the distribution system and any given point on that system to host, typically they're looking at, at solar or EV charging. So that was red and orange, clean energy and decarbonization projects like clean heat initiatives. So a number of states now have, have heat pump initiatives, for example, and smart inverter programs. This is harnessing the technology that's built into every solar product that's sold today to actually uh, be able to have some uh, visibility into it and some control over it. And in gold, market services and customer innovations like innovative electric vehicle programs and innovative tariffs, pricing. The diamonds uh, throughout indicate milestones that the utility intends to achieve throughout for each investment category. Other examples of coordinated planning include in California. There's a rulemaking to modernize the grid for a high distributed resource future, including a more holistic process. And this is replacing the existing distribution pl planning process used today. Minnesota now requires the grid modernization plans that are required by law and the transportation electrification plans to be filed with the utilities integrated distribution plan. And in Hawaii, as I mentioned earlier, they require planning across the electricity system, across generation, transmission, and distribution. The other thing that's very interesting is they're aligning that planning very closely with the procurement to follow. Again, through solicitations, pricing, and programs. And Natalie, we have another Kahoot poll. Okay, it's going to go good. really well. So this should be the same uh, QR code that was already on your phone. And we have another poll. You get to pick from multiple choices. In your state, what other types of plans could be better integrated into utility distribution planning? You can select as many responses as you want. In fact, uh, Natalie didn't give me enough choices. I had more entries <laughs> than we could fit into the poll. All right, yeah, electrification plans, climate plans, demand side management plans. Oh my goodness, really even sweat. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. 
Hi, I'm going to present now instead of just running the Kahoot poll. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I'm going to talk about planning objectives and priorities, and I'm, I'm going to dig in a little bit deeper on those objectives and priorities, and then I'm going to also talk about stakeholder engagement and how states are incorporating stakeholder engagement into distri distribution system planning and how states are incorporating equity and justice into distribution system planning. So as Lisa mentioned, the first uh, step of integrated distribution system planning is identifying objectives and priorities. And as we start to tac tackle issues like um, equitable decarbonization and resiliency, increased collaboration is needed. And that's collaboration with state energy offices, with state policymakers, um, utilities and their regulators, and stakeholders. Uh, the integrated distribution system planning framework that Lisa was talking about that was developed by DOE is designed to turn policy objectives into investment strategies. And some objectives that are uh, more common, like reliability and decarbonization, have metrics that are well established. And other ones, such as resiliency and equity, are th the metrics are evolving and are being developed still. And as we, plan, as we balance and prioritize these strategies, it creates an opportunity to assess technolo technological options and create a deployment strategy. In addition to having state energy uh, policy goals in our integrated distribution system plan, um, a well-designed IDSP is also going to address community needs. And it will also consider the impacts of regional strategies to create a multi-year investment strategy. So I'm gonna talk for the next few slides about what states have been identifying as their integrated distribution system planning objectives and priorities. And um, several states have set goals and objectives that define long-term or high-level outcomes for grid planning. And some of the goals are along more traditional regulatory um, processes such as safety, affordability, and reliability. And there's also newer policy goals that are being identified like transportation electrification, uh, renewable energy integration, and emissions reductions. Um, related outcomes like greater asset utilization and improved integration and utilization of DERs are also showing up. Uh, another, Lisa also mentioned this, but another um, objective that is, we see is around transparency and stakeholder engagement and making sure that regulators can see what the utilities would like to invest in and are investing in and what their process is for making those decisions. So this map on the right side shows uh, the states that some colleagues of mine at Berkeley Lab and at Regulatory Assistance Project um, looked into to identify what objectives and policies or objectives and planning goals have been used in distribution system planning. And we had several common themes that emerged, um, improved grid reliability and resilience, increased customer choice um, and engagement, supporting DER integration and utilization of grid services, reduced emissions, uh, support for a clean energy transition, and accelerating deployment of new technologies. And as I go through these um, themes, you'll see, that, or, or these objectives, you'll see that several of them are overlapping. So the first uh, objective that we saw the most of was grid, grid reliability and resilience. And of the 20 states that we looked at, about 14 of them in DC identified reliability, reliability or resilience as one of their goals. Um, most of the states focused on improving, enhancing, or promoting reliability or resilience. Um, while a few of the states had a general goal of maintaining reliability or resilient electric system um, as the grid moderni modernizes and as DERs are added to the grid. The second objective, uh, I have two on this slide. I'll start on the left with increased customer choice. Uh, we had nine states that identified customer choice as an engagement in energy services as one of their objectives. A few states were identifying objectives related to compensating customers or around data access. And then objectives and goals related to compensation focused on fairly and appropriately compensating customers for the value of DERs that um, are provided to the electricity system. On the right side of the slide, one of the other objectives that we saw was accelerating deployment of new technologies. About 20% uh, of the states had a goal or objective to accelerate the deployment of new technologies and services to optimize grid performance 
and minimize electricity system costs. Uh, two more themes that we saw were around DER integration and emissions reductions. We have about eight states, uh, along with DC, that uh, had a goal or objective support DER integration and utilization of grid services. Um, some examples in Virginia, uh, they required the distribution grid mod plans to include measures to facilitate integration of DERs and measures to enhance reliability. And in Massachusetts, the DPU, the Department of Public Utilities, established four objectives to achieve their grid mod vision, uh, including to facilitate interconnecting DERs and integrating them into utility planning and operations. Some states also discussed DER integration a bit more broadly, such as goals to achieve state renewable energy goals or sustainability. Um, in Illinois, we have some people from the ICC here. They're, the utilities are required to file multi-year integrated grid plans that have multiple objectives, including to ensure coordination with the state's goals on renewable energy and supporting the achievement of state environmental goals, among other objectives. Um, about a third of the states that we uh, reviewed and DC have a GHG emissions reduction goal, and or they had a goal to support the clean energy transition. Three states included supporting a clean energy transition as a goal, and four states and DC link their grid planning goals and objectives to state emissions reduction goals. Um, some examples in Connecticut, there's an equitable modern grid framework, and it enables a cost-effective economy-wide transition to a decarbonized future. And in Michigan, they had a My Power Grid um, initiative that was a multi-year stakeholder initiative to maximize the benefits of a transition to clean distributed energy resources for Michigan's residents and businesses. There were several other themes that came up that um, are important but weren't as commonly mentioned. Stakeholder engagement and transparency, affordability and equity. Uh, I'm going to talk about stakeholder engagement for several slides later on, so I'm going to come back to that one. But affordability was mentioned in several states and in D.C. Typically, the objective is around um, maintaining an affordable system for all customers. Um, another example in Rhode Island, uh, the first objective of their grid mod initiative is to control the long-term costs of the electricity system. Equities included in goals or objectives for grid planning for some states as uh, it's identified as an objective and it also comes up in commission orders. And I'll talk more about that um, on my later slides as well. There's a couple emerging objectives uh, that we're seeing. One is around transportation and building electrification and the other one is around maximizing use of federal funds. And so I'll start with electrification. Um, states and utilities have taken a variety of approaches to address the impact of electrification. Uh, for example, in Massachusetts, the DPU required regulated utilities to develop an electric sector modernization plan and to consider how to accommodate increased building transportation and electrification. Other approaches, utilities can conduct scenario analysis. This is an example from DTE in Michigan. Um, or states can require that utilities file transportation electrification plans with their distribution system related plans. There's examples of that in Nevada and Colorado. There are a variety of reasons that coordinating your transportation and building electrification uh, is beneficial. It can enhance knowledge sharing, facilitate consistent guidance across related processes, provide greater confidence in the results, lower barriers to participation, um, streamline discussions, and generally provide greater transparency. So the second emer emerging objective is around maximizing the use of federal funds. So the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or Bill, and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, um, or IRA, have influenced planning from the utilities. And I'll start off with uh, Bill. And so some examples of how this is showing up in distribution system planning is that the state energy program funding requires that states demonstrate that they're engaged in transmission and distribution planning. And the Grid Resilient Resilience and Innovation Partnership Grants, or GRIP, provide funding to improve grid reliability and resilience, including distribution system planning. And some GRIP grant examples include um, the Los Angeles Department of uh, Water and Power. They have a project to improve distribution system visibility and to dispatch DERs. 
Uh, Consumers Energy in Michigan got a GRIP grant to improve circuits and mitigate outages in disadvantaged communities. Um, in Naperville, Illinois, there was, which is a municipal utility, there's a DER management system GRIP grant. And a co-op in Virginia uh, received funding to enable EV and DER adoption through uh, distribution um, energy through DERM systems. And I'm totally blanking on what DERM stands for. Energy Resource Management System. Thank you. <laughs> so for IRA, there's um, a variety of ways that we're seeing this show up in distribution system planning assumptions. Um, the production and investment tax credits can lower clean energy and storage system costs, and they may accelerate the adoption of renewable energy and storage technologies. Customer incentives can accelerate the adoption of building and transportation electrification and efficiency technologies as well. My next slide, I have a couple of examples of uh, PUC actions and utility actions on this. So in Minnesota, the PUC ordered the utilities to include a discussion of how the utility will maximize benefits of IRA and explain how IRA has impacted the utility's electric vehicle, DER, and electrification assumptions. Um, also, uh, well, in Colorado, but also for Excel, um, for Excel's demand side management and beneficial electrification plan in Colorado, the PUC ordered the utility to establish a timeline to create or update a potential study to consider the effects of IRA in their planning. Um, in s some utilities are considering, uh, th the, the, they're talking about GRIP grants in their applications, um, such as DTE, ComEd, Orange and Rockland in, Rockland in New York, are all talking about how uh, the bill, federal EV incentives, um, and the IRA incentives may influence their planning in the future. And moving forward, we anticipate seeing more of this show up. Um, in particular, changes to load forecasts and technology costs and seeing how that drives changes in distribution system planning. Okay, we have another poll. All right. So, which one of these distribution planning objectives do you think is most important for your state? I don't think you're next yet. I'm going to talk about stakeholder engagement and equity. But you can talk about it if you want. <laughs> okay. Ten seconds left. Which one of these distribution planning objectives do you think is most important for your state? DER integration was the winner on this one, followed by resilience and affordability, electrification and equity coming in, bringing up the rear. Okay. So next, oh, how much, well, can you make it so it'll advance with the clicker, because I use the button, it's, I think it switches. All right, so I'm gonna talk about stakeholder engagement and equity and justice. Oh, it still works, okay. Um, and how this is being, uh, how we're seeing this show up in distribution system plans. So, uh, stakeholder engagement can improve the quality of information and regulatory proceedings, develop solutions with broad support, build trust among parties, and produce better plans. And of the 20 jurisdictions that have utilities, uh, that require utilities to file some type of distribution system plan, about 16 of them include provisions for stakeholder engagement. We're seeing requirements for utilities to engage stakeholders show up at four different points in the distribution system planning process. Um, prior to the plan being filed, um, within the plan, uh, when the utilities have to report on their stakeholder engagement, after the plan is filed, and then uh, in orders considering how the distribution system plan should be modified moving forward. And in addition to all those four pieces, there's also quite a bit of stakeholder engagement around developing the DSP rules. And so many states, as with many regulatory proceeding types, will bring in stakeholders to help form the distribution system planning rules as well. So um, about uh, eight states require regulated utilities to engage stakeholders before they file their plans. Um, an example of that is in Maine. The PUC holds technical conferences or stakeholder workshops before each one of their integrated grid plan filings 
which is about every five years, to identify priorities, assumptions, goals, methods, and tools to assist the utility in developing their plan. There's several states that require utilities to report on stakeholder engagement within the plan. So for example, in New York, um, the, the staff provided guidance on the distribution system plans for the filings for 2023, and they have a variety of different topical areas that need to be covered. And within each one of those topical areas, such as forecasting, grid operations, electric vehicles, storage, et cetera, uh, staff suggested that the utilities include information about stakeholder engagement, um, specifically discussing identifying and characterizing the types of stakeholders engaged in the plan um, when they were developing it, and how the goals and needs of stakeholders are identified and incorporated in the plan. Um, states are also requiring stakeholder engagement after the plan is filed. And uh, I have one example up here from Oregon. The utilities have to hold workshops prior to the plan being filed, um, and they have a community engagement plan, which I'll talk about more in my equity section. But in addition, um, there's a technical working group that holds meetings with the stakeholders both before and after the plan was filed. Let's see. Um, as states are gaining experience with the distribu distribution system planning process, um, we're seeing stakeholder engagement start to evolve. And opportunities to improve stakeholder engagement include making the process more inclusive, providing compensation to interveners, particularly, particularly non-traditional stakeholders, um, or considering equity in identifying and assessing grid solutions. I have two examples on this slide. Um, on the right side is a reliability map from DTE in Michigan. And in response to stakeholders' um, feedback, they developed these reliability improvement maps to show uh, what reliability is and how they're making uh, changes to it within different neighborhoods. Um, another example I have on the bottom of the slide is from Massachusetts. The Grid Modernization Advisory Council provided observation and recommendations on the utility's draft grid mod plans. And some of the recommendations were to develop clear goals, clear reporting metrics um, of success to measure the efficiency of proposed stakeholder engagement, and to bring the Clean Energy Stakeholder Advisory Group and the Grid Modernization Advisory Group together to avoid duplication and reduce stakeholder burden and fatigue. Um, and to develop consistent definitions of equity among other types of definitions. Another example that I have of process improvements is from Minnesota. So in the last um, IDP, the Minnesota PUC required the utility to um, hold at least four stakeholder meet meetings and then file a summary of what they learned from those stakeholder meetings um, prior to filing their 2023 IDP. And in the report, the company noted several areas where they plan to incorporate feedback into their IDP. And uh, some of the examples they gave were how to prioritize locations for their hosting capacity program and alternative rate structures to pay for grid upgrades. And yet the report is at that link there. Um, there were several other ideas that came up. Excel had some interesting findings where they, they we're trying to track what people were interested in, in, in and they found as they went deeper into technical topics that they had less and less attendance. Um, I've been talking with a lot of people as part of um, some work that I'll speak about tomorrow around um, incorporating equity into grid planning and operations about strategies to keep your stakeholders engaged as you get into those technical topics, making sure that you or the utilities are doing the legwork to make the information accessible and available to the people who are attending as opposed to just showing up with the, fa the, the plan and saying like, you know, speaking in our, our, our electric regulatory speak and, and not bringing people along to understand what's, what we're talking about. So moving on to my last topic on energy equity and justice. Um, as I mentioned uh, at, the, at the beginning when I started speaking, there's several states that are incorporating equity and justice into their regulatory requirements. NARUC's actually gonna have um, a webinar on this on Friday talking about equity in, in planning. So tune into that if you're interested. Um, some of the, uh, I'm gonna talk about this more again tomorrow around our work with equity and grid planning and operations and some opportunities for technical assistance we have there. But this map on the right side of the slide is, shows that about half of the US took action on energy equity between January 2020 and July 2022. 
And this is a map that my colleague um, at Berkeley Lab created, and we will be updating this map and uh, three times over the next three years, and it will have a database that's associated with it that uh, discusses energy, uh, that discusses legislative actions, executive orders, and regulatory actions associated with equity that are occurring in the states. And so that'll be a searchable database that'll show up, and then we'll do a summary report that has charts like this as well. So that's, that's something that's going to be updated. But some examples that are focused on distribution system planning. Um, as I said earlier, in Oregon, the utilities have to file, you know, they have stakeholder engagement requirements. And in addition, they are required to consult with community-based organizations um, as they're filing their plan and developing their community engagement plan. And Portland General um, Electric, for example, they hired a community-based organizer to recruit and convene a series of community workshops, develop educational materials, and conduct research for the first distribution plan that the, fi the utility filed. Um, and moving forward, the utilities have to actively collaborate with community-based and environmental justice organizations so community needs inform utility distribution projects. Another example is uh, that in Oregon, Legislation went into effect that gave the commission authority to award intervener funding to environmental justice organizations to participate in the proceedings. Another example from Minnesota, um, similar to the uh, DTE example, commissions required, uh, the commission required Excel to map reliability and service quality metrics and demographic data to reveal any equity issues. And that's what this map is on the right side. And then uh, in Maine, as I mentioned earlier, there was an integrated grid planning uh, law that was passed that requires utilities to assess environmental equity and environmental justice impacts of the grid plans. There's several other examples. Um, Colorado has a lot of action happening in equity. They have a, a couple different tracks that they're following. One's around procedural, one's around trying to incorporate stakeholder feedback into the regulatory proceeding. Um, and this is a, one kind of deeper dive example from Massachusetts. So the grid modernization plans that I've, I've talked about a couple of times, um, the Grid Modernization Advisory Council made recommendations um, and observations about the plans that were filed. And they gave a variety of different um, suggestions about how to improve those. And they also created an equity working group that operated alongside of the Grid Modernization Advisory Council to help uh, review the utilities draft plans and final plans and, and make recommendations. And some of the recommendations that came out of the equity working group were to include collaborative stakeholder development of the electric sector modernization plans or the grid mod plans, to incorporate early stakeholder engagement, to shape engagement plans and modeling assumptions, to standardize definitions of equity across the plans, and to use metrics that reflect the impact of work not just the effort. And uh, the, the equity working group made 12 different recommendations that included procedural recognition and distributive recommendations, which is the first place that I've seen those show up in, in um, distribution system planning. So I believe that that concludes my portion of the presentation. All right, good. We are very excited to finally host um, a data visualization and online catalog of state distribution planning requirements. It's amazing. Um, it has links to uh, regulations all around the country, legislation, uh, and, and actually filed utility plans. It doesn't include all the topics, but it includes a lot of the topics uh, from our forthcoming report on the same topic, state requirements for distribution planning. I think it'll help a lot of you uh, that don't yet have planning requirements for the utilities, or I know there are some of you that are looking to improve uh, the, the, the guidelines or the rules that you have uh, and get better plans. So we're super excited about this. So I'm going to talk about these requirements. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the procedural elements. So uh, frequency of filing, uh, it's typically annual or biennial. And it depends, you know, uh, you have, there are a lot of considerations. If you have integrated resource planning, if you're a vertically integrated state, you might consider alignment. Um, but there's workload. Um, and so you might consider not having all the plans filed all at once. There are ways to get around this. In Oregon, for example, my home state, the first round of distribution plans, they had them filed as part one, certain sections, and part two, certain sections. They're gonna bring them all together 
in subsequent filings. But that was a good approach to sort of deal with workload. Um, and also with respect to filing cycle, uh, distribution plans actually might ch have to change more quickly than integrated resource plans of the bulk power system. And so that's an issue too. So you might want to sync things up, but it might not be frequent enough if your IRPs are filed only every three years, just as an example. Um, utility capital planning, the utilities might have an interest in syncing that up better with the distribution plan filings when they actually have to make decisions. The planning horizon, that, that is how long is the plan, you know, what's the term of the plan? How many years is it looking out? And the action plan is sort of the near term, you know, this is what I'm gonna do, um, and I have much greater certainty around it, because it's in the near term. So that's every two to four years. Um, but we really, I wanna emphasize this, we're looking for a long-term plan. We say five to 10 years, um, but we mean 10. <laughs> it's really important, because some of these investments are large, there's a lot of interdependent components. So you really have to think about this. Confidentiality, this is nothing different than um, every other proceeding. There are reasons why uh, some things remain confidential, but as a former regulator, I will um, acknowledge that the utilities want to make everything confidential and they will assert that it's the easiest thing and then you have to fight it. So to the extent that you can make that clear in your guidance up front, um, really good. So things like level of specificity for hosting capacity, Cody Davis will talk about this a bit and we're, we're helping some states with this issue. Um, peak demand or capacity by feeder, there may be some security issues for both of these things that the utilities have. You know, le legitimate, but they're, they're, there's a discussion to be had there, and states have made different decisions. Contractual cost terms, bidder responses to solicitations, it makes sense to have this confidential um, to preserve competitiveness, otherwise nobody's gonna bid, um, and you know, you have to abide by your contracts for say, models that are proprietary. Um, so, um, and we'll cover, of course, stakeholder engagement. Um, we do cover it in, in the last section. So it is a very important procedural element. All right, I wanna turn to substantive elements. And I'm, I'm gonna cover them at a fairly high level. We're gonna get into more detail in, in the subsequent presentations. So the first item is baseline information and on the current state of the system. So that includes the frequency and duration uh, of power interruptions, all of the acronyms we love, the SADI, SAFI, CAFI, MAFI, MAFI, there's so many. Uh, the equipment ages and conditions, this is super important. There's a lot of aging infrastructure out there uh, and there are different decisions to be made about um, replacing them with you know, different size equipment, you know, maybe upgrading the size for electrification, for example. Historical spending by category. Um, this also may not be the same as in the future, but it's good baseline information. It's a good discussion to have with the utility. Also, what was in their rate case? What did they say they, spend, they, they would spend versus what they actually spent? That's always a good conversation. Typically, you wanted, uh, most states are asking for a detailed description of the utility's planning process. And that includes what they, how they did their load forecasting. And Julieta is gonna talk about that in the next presentation. The utility develops a list of distribution assets with projected overloads and determines the level of load at risk. And then there's a mitigation plan and a budget for planned projects. So while the utility does love to spend money on capital investments, it also has a budget. I mean, so they can't do everything and there, there are competing projects. And so the projects that meet multiple objectives, the projects that are like must have for safety and reliability, these are some of the ways that some projects rise to the top. Uh, of course, legislation, things that the commission is requiring, things like that. So the utility is taking into account the asset health. So there's gotta be pretty good information in the plan around that for you to have a good understanding. The need for system reinforcements, upgrades for capacity and reliability that are needed. And then the planned new systems and technologies. So that was a very succinct summary, but that is a lot. And these are really critical elements to see in the distribution plan and you need a really fulsome <coughs> discussion. So ultimately the utility has to prioritize to fit the budget that they do have. And the projects are then, of course, designed and built and you know, starts all over again. I don't wanna leave out here, we're, we're focused on distribution system planning, but distribution operations are really important. Uh, and so you wanna see in the distribution plan Information, for example, around vegetation management, so important, as we found with all of the wildfires 
uh, we've been suffering, as well as managing the reliability events. What are they doing at the time when there's an outage? How do they you know, prevent it from happening to begin with? And when it does happen, how do you get back on as, long, as, as quickly as possible? We're going to talk about that more tomorrow. All right, data access. There are two kinds of data. There's customer usage data, using interval information from advanced metering infrastructure. And there's also the system level data. So that's data on things like solar hosting capacity and interconnection queues for interconnecting new solar. In some states, for example, New York and California require online data platforms. And that's a standardized way to show the information to whoever wants it developers, customers, third-party service providers. It's all aggregated and shared in a common format. So taking a look at the, the websites, those portals that they have is pretty enlightening. And you, know, you sort of wonder, well, like, why can't other states do this? States also are establishing aggregation requirements to ensure privacy of information, of the customer's information. For example, Colorado has a 1515 rule. It's fairly common in other states. It requires that shared data represent at least 15 customers and no single customer represents more than 15% of the aggregated data. I want to highlight and give a shout out to NARUC's recent resources on uh, grid data sharing. It's really quite helpful. All right, so we, we've talked about how distributed energy resources are one of the drivers for states requiring utilities to file distribution plans for review. And Cody will get into this more later this morning uh, this afternoon, I think, but, but forecasting distributed resources and assessing the distribution system hosting capacity, that is the ability for the uh, distribution grid at that particular spot to host additional solar or EV charging, for example, they're really important <coughs> components of distribution planning today. I want to also give a shout out for geotarding all the programs that your ratepayers are already funding, right? Efficiency, demand response, storage, solar, You've already got the, the, the funds for this. You might consider at least testing geotargeting some of these programs to help meet some of these distribution needs. So you're getting a little bit more bang for your buck. You also can give a slightly additional, a higher incentive for um, resources that will actually help meet the distribution system needs and not just full power system needs. So ultimately, the utility, as I mentioned, conducts a grid needs assessment that evaluates the existing anticipated capacity deficiencies and constraints on the distribution system. And solutions include the traditional utility system upgrades as well as the non-wireless alternatives. And these alternatives can range from a single large battery that's actually fairly common. Uh, and in some states, uh, utilities are allowed to own them and in some states they're not. Uh, and so they'll go out and do a solicitation. Um, and there also could be a portfolio of all kinds of distributed resources that work together to meet the need. Uh, there's also a twist on this where, you know, a lot of these non-wireless alternative solicitations over a long period of time have failed because they don't get enough. Well, but the utility can fill that in potentially, right? So, so we're also looking at some of these hybrid approaches to move forward. And I, I like these non-wireless alternatives because they can reduce distribution system costs. They can leverage customer and third-party capital, so ratepayers aren't paying for all of it. They could potentially defer or avoid infrastructure upgrades with a lot of load uncertainty. That can be super useful, because sometimes things change. Think about COVID and how it changed where the loads were and what times of day. Putting solutions in place incrementally over time, more modular approach, a more flexible approach to this uncertainty in load growth. And Cody Davis will talk about this uh, in detail later today. So another driver, we talked about is grid modernization. So the, um, typically the, the utility is detailing its plans long term. So it's grid modernization strategy over time. There's also an action plan for near term capital investments and operational expenses for major technologies, systems, tools, and programs. Really big bucket, right? So the planning requirements also may specify additional elements when you look across what states are requiring today. So often they'll ask for a utility's long-term vision. Where are you trying to go? Because you're making these investments today, how do they fit with that? The ways distribution planning is coordinated with other types of planning, a summary of stakeholder and community engagement, and proposals for pilots. So 
you know, sometimes we pilot things to death and it never gets out of that. So I'm not, I'm not saying we should do that. But what I'm saying is if the utility doesn't have experience or the commission really wants to see more demonstration before moving full, you know, fledge ahead, that pilots can be a good way to get started. And I think a distribution plan is a good place to tee it up. You're gonna approve that pilot in a tariff filing, probably, but this is a place to tee it up and give it its place and explain why this is coming. So it could be a community resilience project, could be microgrids, could be solar plus storage, fire station, and proposals um, for time varying pricing. So, don't we have till, we have till 10, yeah. All right, so I'm gonna just leave you here. Uh, these slides are posted. We already have a lot of examples of state practices. These hyperlinks are real on the posted slides. And so um, you can adapt what other states have done and uh, customize them for your own state. And we're gonna leave you um, also with the questions that you can ask utilities and stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you.